Last but not least, we will review the parenteral drug administration, which means any non-oral means of administration. Sterile and aseptic techniques must be used for all IV injections. Gloves should always be worn when performing an IV injection. After the injection, all sharps, including needles, must be properly disposed of in a sharps container. Wash your hands before and after all patient contact. Hand washing is the single most effective method for reducing microorganisms. There are five rights for drug administration. These should be followed at all times to avoid medical medication errors. The five rights of drug administration are the right patient, the right time, the right dose, the right drug, and the right route. Always gather all supplies before starting an IV injection. Clean the patient's skin with an iodine-based solution such as providone iodine otherwise known as betadine, or ethyl alcohol 70%. Allow the skin to dry for about one minute before the injection to avoid irritating the site. All five rules of drug administration should be followed. Read the entire label on the drug. Check the name carefully and check the label on the container at least three times. The right patient. Use the institution's protocol for patient identifiers before administering the drug. Ask the patient to repeat his or her name or to give his or her date of birth. Read the patient's identification number and medical record number and or check the patient's birth date as it is printed on the patient's armband. If a patient is too young to speak or is unable to speak, ask the parent or someone else present to identify the patient. If the patient's name or any other identifiers do not match, do not continue. The right time. The physician or practitioner responsible for ordering the drug will usually determine the right time for the administration of the drug. Generally, the technologist does not determine the time, but should administer the drug at the time specified. Once the drug is administered, do not leave the patient unattended. A patient may have an allergic reaction and the technologist must be familiar with the signs of mild, moderate, and severe allergic reactions. Number three, the right route. The right route must be used. The physician can specify the route by which the drug should be administered. The technologist must be familiar with the terminology associated with the most common routes. Number four, the right dose. To ensure that the right amount of the drug is used, it must be measured carefully and accurately. If the drug remains, do not put it back in the original container. Dispose of the drug according to the institutional policy. Before the injection, always check the departmental protocol 
to ensure that the correct amount of the drug is prepared for the exam. And number five, the right drug. Remember that the names of different drugs sometimes sound familiar. When preparing drugs for someone else, always show the container to the person who will administer the drug. Never use a drug that is unlabeled, and if the date has expired, do not use, but report it. Bolus refers to the amount of liquid injected. There are two main supplies, vials and ampules. A vial is a single dose or multi-dose glass containers with rubber stoppers. Ampules contain a single dose of liquid medication and vary in size from one milliliter to 10 milliliters or more. Ampules are made of glass with a narrow scored neck. Please note that it is important to use a two by two cotton gauze when opening the ampule. Break it open to draw up the medication and then remove any air from the syringe. Be sure to show the physician the ampule and syringe when stating out loud what has been drawn up. When opening the vial, pull off the metal cap. To avoid contaminating the content, use alcohol wipes on the rubber seal. The vial is a closed system. To easily remove the liquid, inject a small amount of air into the bottle. There are different methods of administering IV injections. In the direct IV push, the medication is manually injected into the patient. Generally, this method is used if a slower rate is desired or if a large volume of the solution has to be used. Drip infusion involves slowly dripping or infusing the medication into the patient. This method is used to deliver a large volume of solution intravenously over a period of time. The equipment needed is an intravenous pole and an infusion set. In the infusion set, a controller regulates the flow rate by counting the drops and compressing the IV tube to adjust flow. The pump has an alarm to indicate infusion failure. The medication in a drip infusion set should be kept no more than 24 inches above the level of the vein. The routine is 16 to 20 inches. If it is placed higher, it will increase the pressure of the liquid flowing into the veins. The drip rate is controlled by the controller and is regulated electronically. As a general rule, one drop every two to three seconds or 15 to 20 seconds, but no more than 20 drops per minute should be used to prevent pulmonary edema and fluid excess. Technologists should not alter the flow rates of a solution in an infusion set. The piggyback system can be connected to a drip infusion set. The piggyback connects to the secondary infusion to the primary IV therapy. The lines merge into one main line for delivery to the patient. 
not all solutions can piggyback into others. Do not piggyback into any of the following. Cardiac medication, such as Dilatin, to control seizures. Heparin, which is an anticoagulant. Insulin for diabetic care. Nutritional feedings, either total parenteral nutrition, or TPN, or peripheral parenteral nutrition, or PPN, and blood pressure medication. Dextrose, saline, and electrolyte solutions are safe drugs allowed to piggyback. Before connecting to a piggyback, always check if medications are compatible. If using the piggyback to administer contrast, the IV line should be flushed with 0.9% sodium chloride before and after administering the contrast. Generally, the primary infusion containing saline or dextrose is hung lower, sometimes with an extension hanger, than the secondary piggyback with the contrast media. Needles are sized according to length and gauge. Gauge is the diameter or thickness of the needle. The length is the measurement in inches or centimeters of the shaft portion from the hub to the tip. The smaller the diameter of the opening or lumen, the larger the gauge numbers. Needles have four parts. The hub is the part which attaches to the syringe. The cannula, or shaft, is the length of the metal part of the needle. The bevel is the slanted part of the tip of the needle, and the lumen is the size of the opening. The syringe has three parts. The tip, where the needle attaches, the barrel, where the calibration scales are printed, and the plunger, which is the inside part that fits into the barrel. Wing-tipped cannulas, or butterflies, are short, small gauge needles with plastic sidearms. They are sized 19 to 27 gauge and are usually three quarters of an inch long. Wing-tipped cannulas are used for short-term therapy. They can also be used on children, infants, or adults with fragile veins. The wings of the wingtip are used to aid in insertion and securing the needle. These cannulas have a lower risk of phlebitis, but suffer from a decreased mobility due to the rigid nature of the needle, as they also represent or present an increased extravasation risk. The angiocatheter is a catheter mounted on a needle. It is 10 to 27 gauge and 3 quarters to 3 inches in length. These are used for active patients and allow for more mobility than the wing tips. They can be used for long-term therapy and are less prone to infiltrations. They can also be used with power injectors. However, they are more likely to cause phlebitis, can kink, and may cause emboli with improper insertion techniques.
Needleless systems are becoming more popular and are widely used in some facilities. These systems will reduce the chance of needle sticks. Needleless systems use a HEP lock design and have a white ring on the port. The HEP lock identifies a needleless system and needles should not be used to access these systems. The type of needle or cannula used will depend on the fluid infused, the route of drug administration, the anticipated duration of therapy, the patient's condition, the condition and size of the patient's vein, and the age of the patient. Needle length and gauge length can also depend on the viscosity of the drug, the site selected, and the specific method of injection. As a general rule, shorter needles are used for subcutaneous injections and longer needles are used for intramuscular injections. The smaller the diameter or lumen of the needle, the larger the gauge numbers. The most common sites for venipuncture injections are located on the arm. These are the metacarpal veins, the basilic vein located on the inner side of the biceps just above the elbow, the cubital vein which is any vein on the elbow or on the forearm, and the median vein of the forearm. If arm veins are not available, pedal veins in the foot can be used. Site selection can depend on a number of factors. The length of time of a patient is to receive the IV therapy. It is best to avoid joints when patients need long-term therapy as this will interfere with flexion movements. Avoid the dominant hand and leave proximal veins for long-term therapy and lower arm veins for short-term therapy. Patient's medical history, compromised sites would be sites that are infiltrated, red, swollen, or sites that are inferior to the compromised site. A site inferior to the compromised site cannot be used because the blood will travel through the irritated areas. You would also avoid areas of the skin inflammation, disease bruising, or breakdown, and areas affected by radical mastectomies. And edema, because there is an increased risk of infection due to the removal of lymph nodes. Patients with blood clots, infections, or an arm with arterial venous shunt or fistula should also be avoided. Patients age, size, and general condition, older patients may have thin superficial veins with obese patients, only the veins in the hand may be available. With young children, you may need to use the veins of the hands, arm, and feet. For neonates and small infants, veins in the scalp, hands, arms, and feet may be the only option. Newborn infants and neonates may be accessed by the umbilical artery or vein. 
cut downs on the long saphenous vein of the leg or a central line can also be used. Conditions of veins. Veins in the lower extremities are usually the last resort. Avoid veins below a phlebotic area, bifurcation veins, and sclerosed or thrombosed veins. Veins that are tortuous or hard to see or palpate. Repeatedly used veins and veins over arteries should also be avoided. Your skills at venipuncture can also determine your site selection. The general rule of thumb is to select the lowest site possible, so if necessary, the site can be moved to a more superior position. Never inject into an artery. There is risk of damage to the artery and a severe loss of blood. The first step in venipuncture is a technique used to find the vein. The best veins to approach are the firm, round, elastic, and engorged ones. They should rebound after pressure. Veins that are hardened, bumpy, or flat, or knotty should be avoided. To palpate a vein, use two fingers and not the thumb, which can have a pulse. Superficial veins have a tendency to roll. To prevent rolling, maintain the vein touted and distended. Hand veins may be easier to immobilize than arm veins because they are surrounded by less fat. In venipuncture, a tentative approach can injure the vein, causing bruising. The vein should be stabilized before the injection. Inadequate vein stretching allows the cannula to push the vein aside. Care should be taken not to puncture the opposite wall of the vein, indicated by blood flow then no blood flow. Do not insert the cannula too deep. Recognize when the cannula cannot move freely. When inserted into muscle and fascia, patients will have severe discomfort. Improper insertion is when the cannula riding on top or below the vein. The next step in venipuncture technique is applying the tourniquet. A tourniquet or a blood pressure cuff is used to help find a site for venipuncture. It is a soft rubber about one inch or 2.5 centimeters wide and about 15 to 18 inches long or 45 centimeters. The tourniquet should be applied one to three inches or 2.5 to 7.6 centimeters above the venipuncture area. Make sure the tourniquet is not pinching the patient. The tourniquet should not be left on for more than a minute. Not only does it become uncomfortable, but it can also cause hemoconcentration, which is increased blood concentration of large molecules such as proteins, cells, and coagulation factors. The tourniquet should be immediately removed after cannulating the vein for contrast injections. The tourniquet is not removed during blood draw procedures.
Before injecting any contrast, you must verify patency. Patency means that you are in the vein. This can be confirmed by visualization. However, the proof is verified when blood returns into the syringe upon aspiration. It should also be possible to inject 5 cc's of normal saline without extravasation. After the injection of contrast media, the vein should be flushed with saline injection. Inadvertent injection of large amounts of air into the venous system can result in air hunger, dyspnea, cough, chest pain, pulmonary edema, tachycardia, hypotension, and expiratory wheezing. Another complication is extravasation which is a discharge or escape of the contrast or solution from the vein into the tissue. Infiltration is the movement of a needle or cannula from within a vein into the surrounding tissue and inadvertent administration of the contrast or solution into the tissues. Symptoms of extravasation and infiltration are similar and can include a slowed flow of fluids, swelling, pallor, coolness of the skin, or discomfort in the area. The severity of the symptoms will depend on the amount and type of fluid infused. Large extravasations of some medications may lead to contractures with the need for debridement and grafting and in severe cases amputation. Air emboli is air in the circulatory system. An air emboli is as small as one milliliter in the arterial circulation may travel to the brain or coronary arteries, causing significant blockage. Phlebitis is an inflammation of the vein resulting from vasodilation. It can result from leaving the catheter too long in the vein, constant movement of the needle at the insertion site, chemical irritation of the medication or a traumatic insertion of the catheter. The signs and symptoms are redness or warmth at the site, palpable cords along the vein, or a sluggish infusion rate. Treatment involves the use of warm packs or medication such as NSAIDs in the form of ibuprofen or antibiotics for severe cases. Prior to taking the examination, please reread the module objectives to verify that you have no additional questions to review. Thanks for watching. To purchase the full course and earn your CE credits, click on the link in the description or head on over to our website at www.medical-professionals.com. And while you're there, check out our All Access Pass, where you can get unlimited CE credits for your state and ARRT renewal for just $49.99. We also offer a host of free resources to make it easier than ever for radiologic technologists like you to achieve excellence. Check out our free radiology CE webinars, clinical reference guides, and free CE courses on our website today. Be more than just certified. Choose medical professionals.